Good morning. We'll go ahead and call this Churchill County Commissioner's meeting to order. At this time, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, is there any public comment? Go ahead and push that little red button at the bottom of the mic. Good morning. My name is Lonnie Fott, and I am here on behalf of Ashley Laka. She is the founder of Love Fallon, and you may have seen some of these signs around town. So she just asked me to come and give you a little bit of information and request some support for this community event. So Love Fallon is under the umbrella of a national organization called Love Our Cities, and it's basically just trying to give back to the communities that we live in. So Ashley wanted to bring that here to Fallon. Love Fallon is a nonprofit organization, and it is a one-day community service event. So different projects, it will be a kickoff at Oats Park at 8.30 a.m., and that will kind of be a kickoff and then people will disperse to different service activities throughout the community. Some of the projects that currently are going to be done will be a mural painted on the side of the ABA building next, across the street from the public library, school landscape cleanup, uh, preparing pancakes for Vonto breakfast, a police car wash for their patrol cars, affirmation cards for our community and the elderly, flower pens for teachers, and some other projects that we're still currently working on. And there is a website, and they encourage everyone to go to the website. It is lovefallon.org to sign up for the project that they would like to participate in. Um, we already have several um, partners, our financial sponsors so far, The Depot and Pizza Barn. Also supporting this effort so far, which of course we're still working on, the City of Fallon, Oasis Community Church, Epworth United Methodist Church, Victory Baptist Church, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and Just Serve. And of course, we are just trying to raise awareness about this event, and we want the entire community to be involved. We're trying to get as many community members, businesses, public figures involved in this event as possible, and hopefully look to grow this event to be an annual um, event. As far as support, we've raised $600 through sponsorships. The goal would be 2000 and any support, even a couple hundred dollars, of course, would go a long way. Our main request um, from the commission would be to just help us disperse this information to the community. Like we said, we would like to get as many businesses, community members, and different public figures involved in this event as we can. And we do have the support from the city, and we just wanted to make sure that the county was aware of this project that is, is going on in this event, and just wanted to give you the opportunity to support that and just be aware of it and help us to get the information out to as many people within your reach as possible. So thank you for your time, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. At this time, could I get a verification of the posting of the agenda, please? Pam Moore, for the record, the agenda was mo posted on March 29th between the hours of 8 and 11 at the, all of the locations listed on the agenda in accordance with statutes. Thank you, Pam. This will be a revised agenda. Can I get a motion to approve it? I move to approve the revised agenda. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Six, consideration of possible action, approval of the minutes of the meeting held on March 7th, 2024 and March 20th, 2024. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of uh, March 7th and March 20th of 2024. Second it. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Moving to our first appointment, 7A, consideration of possible action, adoption of a joint proclamation with Churchill County and the City of Fallon designating April 2024 as Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. Shannon. Good morning, for the record, Shannon Ernst, Churchill County Social Services, and I have Brittany Burton, also from Churchill County Social Services. As you are aware, that April has been proclaimed as Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. Over the past several years, we have done a, a joint uh, proclamation with the city declaring this, and we're asking to do this again. Um, as of tomorrow, you will see the town is painted blue as for this event, and we will have a kickoff at Millennium Park at 10 a.m. Um, with emceeing is your chair here. So we're very excited to have this with many speakers. Um, our goal through the month is to provide free uh, family fun events. 
Um, so we will be having a free sponsored movie at the theater with free snacks. Uh, we'll have the carnival at the Life Center, which provides agencies coming in, playing with the kids and the parents and showing what are good activities. Um, and then of course, the great Easter egg hunt, which is sponsored by Parks and Recreation. Um, and that has launched. And these are things that the community does look forward to. Um, so we're asking for you to approve this proclamation today and join us each Friday to wear blue to build awareness through the month of April. If there's any questions. Thank you, Shannon. Any questions or comments from board or staff? I'll go ahead and read the proclamation real quick. Whereas the Nevada Institute for Children's Research and Policy is the Nevada chapter of Prevent Child Abuse America with a belief in prevention to ensure child children live in safe, stable, nurturing environments since healthy child development is the foundation for community and economic development and the building blocks of the flourishing society and stable nation. And whereas effective child abuse prevention strategies exceed because of partnerships created among citizens, human services agencies, schools, faith communities, health care providers, civic, civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community. <coughs> Whereas studies have continuously showed that child abuse and neglect have far reaching consequences to victims, families, and the community and the economy. And whereas with the overarching goals of community resource, public awareness, prevention programs, and advocacy, Prevent Child Abuse Nevada has the vision to be a community leader, partner, and resource in preventing child abuse and neglect in the state of Nevada. And whereas through community outreach efforts, including Pinwheels for Prevention and the Go Blue Day on April 5th, 2024, Prevent Child Abuse Nevada invites residents to join in preventing child abuse. And whereas America's premier community, Churchill County, has a goal to ensure public safety for our residents of all ages in partnership with organization, organizations such as Prevent Child Abuse Nevada, seeks to provide services and resources to protect the lives of our citizens. Now, therefore, Ken Tedford, Ken Tedford, Mayor of the City of Fallon, Nevada, and I, Miles Ghetto, Chairman of the Board of County Commissioners, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2024 as Child Abuse Prevention Month. With that, can I get a motion, please? I move to adopt the joint proclamation declaring April 2024 as Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Shannon. Um, Mr. Chair, we're asking for a picture, and um, I would like to ask Brittany Burton, Jill Manna, and Emma Camp actually to take the photo with you. They are really the crew behind this event and putting this all together, and I want to thank them. Moving on to appointment 7B, presentation of public lands and natural resource tracking list, Jeremy Drew. Morning commissioners, thanks for taking me so early on a beautiful spring morning in Nevada. Uh, our first update um, is just a quick overview of some of the things that we're tracking as relates to natural resource and public land issues in the county. Um, as far as the, the report in your packet um, on FRTC and the implementation of Public Law 117-263, there hasn't been a lot of change in the sequencing of what's going on. Um, the focus recently has really been on grazing compensation for B16 and the three affected permittees and also trying to work out a system and a template that's going to ultimately work for everyone in B17 and B20. 
Um, so a lot of focus on that. Um, I think there's a lot of work yet to be done, uh, but there has been progress. And then of course, one of the things that the county is really involved in is working on uh, getting Sand Canyon Road rerouted and Lone Tree Road reconstructed uh, to meet some, some better standards for clearance and things like that. And so we'll be meeting with B Bureau of Rec and BLM uh, at the middle of the month to talk a little bit more about that, as well as some of our conveyances and what that process is gonna look like um, going forward. I know the BLM had mentioned uh, the need for the county to submit an SF-299 for Sand Canyon Road, and we'll have that done uh, shortly and, and likely before the meeting that we have with them um, so they're not waiting on anything from us. Um, as far as other issues going on in the county, uh, BLM Greater Sage Grouse uh, came out for a 90-day review. We've been a cooperating agency on that and have spent a lot of time focused uh, on comments regarding their mapping and some of their um, updated restrictions and, and limitations that they're proposing because obviously that affects the eastern uh, portion of the county. And so we'll be coming back uh, between now and June with some comment letters um, on that. I would point out that the state of Nevada was looking to adopt uh, some new sage grouse maps um, that for Churchill County, I think are relatively benign in terms of nothing uh, significantly changing, although there was a lot of behind the scenes work to make sure that that happened because uh, some of the early runs of the USGS model actually had some pieces of the county um, shown as sage grouse habitat that are clearly not. Um, Greenlink North, we're going to talk about uh, on our next agenda item. Uh, Vero Fiber Optics, I believe, has a decision record, so not much left to do there. And then there's an update uh, for wild horses um, there at the end in terms of the updated herd numbers. Uh, the only th other thing that I provided, because there's such a focus on it, is the B16 work schedule that was provided at the last IEC meeting. And you'll kind of see how things uh, are scheduled to lay out of course, all pending uh, funding and actually getting that funding in hand so we can start design on the two roadways. With that, um, I've got a long second and third agenda item, so I'll stand for any questions. Any questions for Jeremy? Okay, thank you for your time on that one. Moving on to 7C, consideration of possible action. Approval of a second scoping comment letter to the Bureau of Land Management Environmental Impact Statement for the Greenlink North 500 KV power line, power transmission line and proposed three mile wide utility corridor. Chairman, for your record, Jeremy Drew, Principal Resource Specialist with Resource Concepts. Uh, this is actually the second scoping comment letter that we've provided to BLM. Um, and what they're proposing here is actually in addition to the proposed power line is a new three mile wide utility corridor. Um, you'll see on the, on the screen before you kind of what the Carson City BLM currently has designated uh, for corridors and all their planning corridors are actually two miles wide. Um, there's a few concerns that this brings up and the irony in the whole thing is that the reason the BLM is now proposing a three mile wide corridor is their own sage grouse restrictions prevent them from developing the line without a corridor. Um, and so when it comes to Churchill County, uh, there's some, um, some issues with the master plan in terms of uh, having to work through a master plan amendment potentially to designate uh, a utility corridor. And then as I mentioned, there's some con conflicts uh, between what BLM is proposing and what's in the current Carson City R RMP. Um, we have some concerns south of here on US 95. You'll recall during in the lands bill, we have several recreation public purpose conveyances as well as the city of Fallon landfill. Um, that we were lucky enough to reroute the power line out of those areas, but now the corridor uh, goes back and, and overlaps them. And so we wanna obviously see if we can get away with that. Uh, in the eastern portion of the county, we have the new, newly designated wilderness area in the Desitoya and the Klan Alpine. That three mile, mile corridor abuts right up against them. Um, and not probably the best planning idea to put an ignition source immediately next to a wilderness area where you have limitations on uh, fuels management and fire control. And so really the punchline and the recommendation that we have to the BLM um, is to sit down and talk through a little bit more uh, what would make sense uh, for a corridor and how it relates to the existing corridors uh, in the RMP. Um, the other concern that we have, and we had a lot of back and forth uh, with the congressional delegation and with the Navy, but as you'll see on this map, the existing corridor 
runs into and out of the Dixie Valley training area. And so by designating a three mile wide corridor, I don't know if we want to send the message that that is completely open for, you know, unlimited utilities because that wasn't necessarily intent, uh, at least of the county when we negotiated, making sure we had some semblance of connectivity across the county. Um, with that, I think those are the high points. Uh, as I said, they are considering an alternative uh, to a line outside of the RMPP parcel south of town. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is the three mile corridor, I think, presents some new challenges. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions or comments for Jeremy? Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> Jeremy, why are they asking for three mile instead of two mile? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, Commissioner, and I actually asked that in their public meeting. Um, a couple years ago, they did a, a west-wide, what they called a, a Section 368 west-wide energy planning study. And in some areas, and in particular in the the um, Battle Mountain District of BLM, they designated some three mile wide corridors. Those corridors were primarily in checkerboard and I think that's why they were that wide. And so when I asked that question, they kind of hung their hat on, well, the West Wide Energy Project designated three mile wide corridors, but that's not, what, that's not consistent with what we have here in Carson City. Uh, and that's the concern I get into and we'll touch on in the next agenda item, but all this regionalized planning, um, really something like this should be done through a resource management plan update, not a one-off through a project. And so I always really push back to try and stay as consistent as possible with the resource management plan that's on the district. In this case, we may actually be able to improve what's going on, but just throwing three miles around the proposed alignment um, isn't going to get us there. I think it's going to take a little bit more thought and a little bit more due diligence to get this thing right. Did they answer you when you asked that question? They no. They just said that it was consistent with the 368, and I hadn't. I didn't have this at my fingertips, but I n knew it. Something didn't sound right. <laughs> so I've okay. I have since verified that, and it is now in our letter. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Is there any public comment on this agenda item? Seeing none, can I get a motion, please? Yeah, I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the scoping comment letter to the Bureau of Land Management's Green Link North 500 KV Power Transmission Line Environmental Impact Statement. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. 7D, consideration of possible action approval of a comment letter to the Bureau of Land Management Environmental Impact Statement for the Utility Scale Solar Energy Development Pro Programmatic EIS and Resource Management Plan Amendment. Jeremy. Right. For your record, Jeremy Drew, Principal Resource Specialist with Resource Concepts. Um, what I'm going to present to you today is just a quick uh, update of what the BLM is trying to do as relates to solar development uh, across 11 western states. Um, this kind of ties into our previous agenda item because the minute you have a new transmission line, you're going to start seeing solar applications pop up. We've seen this uh, significant amount of applications in White Pine County. Um, we've now had two applications pop up in Lyon County, and I would anticipate it's just a matter of time before we start seeing more applications here in Churchill County. And so I felt like giving this update today was uh, good to get you up to speed with what BLM's trying to do. We don't have a letter drafted. Uh, what we're asking for is some guidance so that I can work with the county manager between now and April 18th to get a letter together. Um, but we're working this with several counties. And so what I wanted to do is just scroll through quickly what the BLM was saying, share some maps with you, and then share some uh, themes of a, what I think should go into a comment letter. So we'll see if I can advance the slides. And I don't know that I can. So Pam, if we could go to the next slide. Um, what the BLM's looking to do is expand an effort that they started in 2012 for six western states now to 11 western states. Uh, so they will add Oregon and Washington to the north. Their intent here is to try and guide solar into better locations and address some of the changes since 2012. So in 2012, one of the limitations they had was unless an area was over a, sol a certain solar insulation value, um, they didn't consider it for any sort of development. So if you look at the state of Nevada, pretty much Highway 50 is kind of a cutoff where anything south of that was available and anything north was not. The technology has evolved 
where now these companies are starting to push projects further and further to the north. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, some of the key elements in 2012, it was a six state planning area. Now they're up to 11. Um, in 12, they worked really closely with some of the counties, and we represented Lincoln on this, where they actually developed solar energy zones where they wanted solar energy to go. In some cases, that worked really well. In the case of Lincoln County, it never worked because they weren't adjacent to an existing substation. Um, and then they also had what they called a variance area. So if a company didn't want to develop in one of those zones, they had to go coordinate with the BLM and the local governments to say, hey, this is a good place to develop solar. They could get that approved pre-NEPA and then go through the whole environmental review process. What we found with some of the other counties is that variance process is the only thing that has taken some of the speculation out of where these projects go and forced the developers to come to the county and actually consult as to whether or not this is a good place before we get into a whole dispute through the NEPA process, which is never a fun uh, way to go. So one of the concerns I have is that they're actually proposing to take the variance area out and they're doing this 11 state GIS exercise in essence to say what areas are gonna be off limits to solar development and what areas will be open to solar development. Um, as BLM will say, that doesn't necessarily mean they're approving any projects, um, but we still need to really focus, in my opinion, on making sure they're sited in the right locations. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the interesting things they ran here was a reasonably foreseeable development scenario, and I think what they're saying is in Nevada, they anticipate in the next uh, 20 years that we'll have about 48,000 acres of solar developed on public lands. Um, I think that number might be low, quite frankly. There's probably 48,000 acres and applications pending in White Pine County alone right now, let alone Clark, Nye, and uh, some of the other rural counties. Um, but what you'll see is uh, they're, they're thinking that um, a lot of the alternatives they've proposed is going to open up a lot more area for solar application than they truly need to meet, essentially, this pro projected demand. Scroll to the next page. The next page kind of proposes or just shows how the different alternatives are laid out. So alternative one would be the most area open uh, for solar energy development. They have some resource-based exclusions that they're trying to apply across that 11 state area. Alternative two adds in a requirement that they have to stay under a 10% slope. Alternative three makes sure they're close to transmission. So essentially within a 10 mile uh, buffer of existing or planned transmission. Um, four focuses more on lands that have been previously disturbed, but they're relying on a, a solar or a satellite model for that, which I don't think got it quite right. And then five is a combination of previously disturbed lands and transmission proximity. And what will stand out is how that changes where solar is available when we look at the maps. Next slide, please. This one we can scroll right by. That's kind of how it works out by alternative in different states. Um, I'll show you uh, how that works out better. Alternative three is the BLM's preferred alternative. The one issue I have with this is they're talking about staying within 10 miles of an existing transmission line. What we found is it doesn't matter how close you are to a transmission line. What really matters is how close you are to a substation. If we could scroll down to the next page. These are all the different elements that they address in the programmatic EIS. Because it's such a big planning area, they do this at a very, very broad level. Uh, which is one of my concerns, but that's all the things they're assessing. Next slide, please. And some of these we can zip through pretty fast. They do have required design features, and this will come into play that every project would have to follow once they file an application. And this is one place where I think coordination with the local government prior to NEPA would be key to adding. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the exclusion criteria. And Pam, let's scroll down just a little bit. Um, you'll see that there's, I think, 21 different exclusion criteria, everything from sage grouse to big game uh, habitat and movement corridors. The, the challenge that I have with this is if it isn't in a BLM resource management plan, it's not on these maps. Um, and that becomes a problem, especially when you're in a county that has an outdated resource management plan. Uh, so. For example, um, some of the sage grouse mapping isn't completely updated. Um, in, in the case of Churchill County, uh, all the things that are in the new public lands or the public law from the NDAA 
have not been incorporated into the maps. And so obviously we'll flag that. Um, and again, there's no exclusion criteria um, in the case that something doesn't meet your local master plan or your local public land policy plan. Uh, there's nothing that they use to screen that out. And then Pam, we can actually skip down at this point to the, um, the maps. So I think two slides down. Yep. Right there. Okay. This shows uh, the pink areas show across the alternatives what is excluded. Green shows what's open for solar development. And that little bar at the bottom is their projected uh, development scenario. So as you'll see, they have significantly more land available for solar than they project needing over the next 20 years. And what that starts to look like on maps, if we scroll down to the next page, this is the no action alternative. So right now, solar could only occur in Churchill County uh, within those blue areas, and those are variants. So again, if a solar project came in and applied for a project in one of those areas, they would have to come to the county first and coordinate with you all, and then the BLM would have to sign off on that before they ever began NEPA. And you can kind of see that um, back in 2012, where those solar insulation values were, and where we had land available at a less than 10% slope. Uh, obviously, a lot of this is gonna come off the table because of the Navy expansion, um, as well as some of the other lands bill components, but it gives you a sense of what our starting point was. If we scroll down to the next page, we'll see this is kind of the maximum extent of potential development. This is alternative one. So the only thing they've applied here is those resource exclusion er um, factors, so those 21 criteria that I showed on the, uh, the table. As you'll see, you know, you have potentially open area all the way over the top of the Stillwaters. They need to update their mapping because that's now a wilderness area, um, but it gives you a sense of just how broadly it would open the county for solar application, uh, and I'm not so sure we wanna go there. The next alternative adds the 10% slope criteria, and it really pulls everything down into the valley bottoms and off the toes of the slope. Um, again, I think that's pretty significant in terms of the amount of open area there. If we go down to the next one, remember this is the BLM's preferred alternative. Uh, so you'll see all of northern um, Dixie Valley is opened up. Uh, there's a lot of land around Grimes Point uh, that quite frankly probably shouldn't be open for solar development. Um, and you'll see in some of those darker pink areas, uh, those areas that start to fall off the map because they're greater than 10 miles away uh, from a transmission line. If we go down to the next map, this is the one that's supposed to kind of focus on areas that were previously disturbed. Uh, primarily, they're looking at satellite imagery for um, noxious weeds or uh, areas that are cheatgrass. Um, again, I'm not so sure that this makes the most sense for Churchill County either. And if we go to the last map, this would be the most restrictive area. And again, you'd have to be within 10 miles of a power line and in an area that was previously disturbed or had primarily um, noxious weeds or cheatgrass. Again, I'm not so sure this makes sense when you look at it on a countywide basis. And the last slide, please. Um, so some of the main themes of the letter, and this is uh, gonna be based on a template that we've already set up. Um, obviously, we have a concern with the, the scope of the planning area across 11 states. This is something that NACO uh, has been working on pretty diligently recently not only for this effort, but for the sage grouse effort. Um, years ago, BLM did an exercise called Planning 2.0, where they were trying to regionalize their plans. Uh, and NACO and a lot of the local counties uh, strongly objected to that because you take out um, that local input. And so that's gonna definitely be one of the main themes of our letter. Because of the, the scope and scale of the planning area, we have some issues with the mapping. For example, the NDAA designations aren't in there. Um, some of the exclusions rely on mapping and RMPs that are way outdated. That's the case here. Um, based on the above, you know, we think that they either need to keep the variance process or some requirement pre-NEPA that requires a developer to come coordinate with the county and make sure there's not an issue with local court codes, ordinances, or, or plans. Um, there's really nothing in here, and this has been our problem with the variance area, that prevents speculation. So what happens is it's almost like mining. A new power line's proposed, a company comes in, throws in a 10,000 acre application for solar development with no intent of ever developing that. They just wanna tie up the land and then sell it to someone who is intent on developing it. 
and it may be five or 10 years down the road. Uh, and that just takes up a lot of staff time um, and causes all sorts of issues. So uh, we don't wanna go there. Um, I asked the question, do we have a preferred alternative? Quite frankly, and what I'm looking at in the BLM and when I look at the maps, I don't think anything stands out as something we wanna uh, advocate for. One of the things that NACO and other Western counties have looked at is what they're calling a Western Alliance alternative, which is attached. And essentially what that does is really push for solar development in areas um, of low conflict, uh, in areas that have been uh, previously disturbed or converted to cheatgrass. Um, so it might be an area that's burned, that's come back strictly to cheatgrass and doesn't have a, a ton of value or multiple use on it. Um, and to me, for Churchill County, I think that is the one we want to advocate for because it has the strongest tie back to the mandate for coordinating with local government. Um, and then if there's any other things or themes that the, the commission would like us to incorporate in the letter, uh, I'm all ears, but that's kind of where I'm thinking we want to go with the comment at this point. With that, Chair, uh, open to any inputs or I will attempt to answer any questions. I know that's a lot to digest in five minutes. Is there any questions or comments for Jeremy? Yeah, Jeremy, with these solar farms, can you graze the land where these things are at? Yeah, great question. So um, I think by and large the answer is no, particularly if you have cattle. We've had a couple of developers that have told us um, that sheep grazing may be an option. There are some technologies that don't require them to completely um, clear everything of vegetation underneath the panels. And some of the technology is still um, to a point where you have to clear all the vegetation. So I think by and large, the answer is no. And that's been one of the biggest concerns in some of the other counties, in addition to the loss of ac uh, access and recreation, is the loss of grazing. Uh, essentially, and this is what I've tried to articulate to BLM and anyone else that would listen, in these cases, a lot of times what you're doing is going from multiple use, which is BLM's mandate, to a singular use. And the county really is only seeing the revenue that's generated on construction of the project. It's not like a geothermal plant where you guys get a royalty or a piece of that royalty. BLM gets a lease payment and the county doesn't see any of that. So with the exception of maybe one or two jobs, you know, the folks that operate or maintain the system, there's not a lot of long-term economic benefit there. Uh, and when you start looking at what you lose on multiple use, that's why I'm such a big advocate of making sure that the solar developers come and talk to the county first before we even get into the NEPA process. Good I question. Have question. I have a question. And this might be also for Jim. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this company that's coming in to build solar around the railroad tracks, around in that area. Is any of that going to come to Churchill County? Any of the power? Any of the power? No. No, that'll be connected to, um, I think the, the, the master plan, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeremy, it'll all feed to um, the uh, Green Link project uh, that, that will then go into some of these substations. Potentially down the road, a substation could divert uh, power uh, as we need power for development in the 40 mile uh, desert and in the Hazen Desert based on the meeting that we had last week with Nevada Energy, but they won't um, entertain a large volume of power until they have a company committed and it's like a six year process. Yeah, just to build off that and maybe speaking more broadly, most of the projects that we have seen in other counties, um, they're primarily cust their primary customer is Envy Energy. So what they're trying to do is develop projects uh, get a power purchase agreement with NV Energy, and then NV Energy is using the power ultimately from those projects to meet their um, renewable portfolio standards. Uh, so there is the potential that some of that energy could someday be used in Churchill County, but primarily your load centers are going to be, you know, Washoe County, uh, Reno Sparks, and and Las Vegas. We uh, we have the Churchill County lands bill passed by Congress. Does that mean that, that Nevada Energy would be purchasing the properties from Churchill County 
or from BLM? I'll grab that one, Jeremy. Yep. Um, currently, the projects that are being looked at in Churchill County are on private property, not on federal property. So they're on, they're on Tim's old land? Well, there's multitudes. I don't think actually, I'm not sure of that okay. statement, but there's multiple private owners that are um, uh, looking at solar projects on that ground. Adjacent to that, in many cases, uh, are federal grounds that could potentially be opened up through checkerboard because of the the lands bill, but you know we're we're a ways out on that. Do you know if any other counties have done solar projects on like salt flats or dried lake beds? Uh, that is a fantastic question. So we've had one project proposed uh, in White Pine County for Jakes Valley, and there's a huge playa out there. Um, and we actually asked uh, the solar developer, you know, why they didn't look at developing on the dry lake bed. And they said, well, we don't want to be um, in a quote unquote floodplain, which is ironic because the day before we had talked to a developer that said, we should develop on this piece of private land because it's a floodplain and you can't build anything else there. Um, I think the biggest issue with that is um, some BLM RMPs will actually flag playas as like a sensitive habitat. I don't think Carson City necessarily has that. To me, the bigger issue is probably associated with dust or if something goes wrong getting out there and, and dealing with your solar panels when, you know, obviously you shouldn't be out there driving around. And so, you know, you look at a lot of this and, and some of those playa areas are excluded. I think a lot of the big ones in Churchill, with the exception of maybe the north end of Dixie, you know, the Navy's going to occupy a lot of that area. But um, I haven't got a straight answer depending on the developer you talk with. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I just thought it was best of both worlds. You put it up against the edge, I'm sure it won't get dusted out. You're not affecting any grazing ground. All right. So, any other questions? Any public comment? Seeing none, can I get a motion? I move to authorize the county manager in coordination with RCI to develop and send a comment letter to the Bureau of Land Management's draft environmental impact statement for the utility scale solar energy development program, programmatic EIS and resource management plan amendment. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, Commissioners. Consideration of possible action appointment of Jessica Rowe to the Library Board of Trustees to fill an unexpired term ending October 31st, 2026. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chris, would you mind introducing Randy and Jeremy before Jeremy heads out? In, yeah, before he heads and leaves out. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry about that. Um, so we did have recently a um, um, opening uh, from a vacancy on the Library Board. Uh, the vacancy on the board was advertised for uh, for a couple of months. We received two applicants, uh, Jessica Rowe and Allison Deagle, uh, were our applicants. Um, the assistant county manager, uh, the library director, and myself uh, went through an interview process. And through that process, um, uh, we deemed that uh, Jessica Rowe seemed to have more experience and alignment uh, with uh, uh, would be more beneficial on uh, to the library on the library board and therefore we bring this recommendation for the appointment of Jessica Rowe. Any questions or comments for Jim or Jessica since you're here? Is there any public comment? Seeing none, can I get a motion please? I'll make a motion <clears throat> to appoint Jessica Rowe to fill an unexpired term on the Library Board of Trustees through October 31st, 2026. Second it. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. We'll go ahead and swear you in right now, too. I'll be giving you your oath, and you can repeat after me. Okay. I, Jessica Rowe. I, Jessica Rowe. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will pro support. That I will support. Protect and defend. Protect and defend. The Constitution and government. The Constitution and government. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the Constitution and government. And the Constitution and government. Of the State of Nevada. Of the State of Nevada. Against all enemies. 
against all enemies, whether domestic or foreign, whether domestic or foreign, and that I will bear true faith, and, I, and that I will bear true faith, allegiance and loyalty, allegiance and loyalty, to the same, to the same, to any ordinance, to any ordinance, resolution, resolution, or law of any state, or law of any state, notwithstanding, notwithstanding, and that I will, and that I will, well and faithfully, well and faithfully, perform all duties, perform all duties, of the office or position, of the office or position, library board trustee, library board trustee, on which I'm about to enter, on which I'm about to enter, so help me God, so help me God. Just get Congrats, Jessica. Moving on to appointment 7F, consideration of possible action, application for funding in the amount of $3,500 to support the Fallon Armed Force Day event. Mr. Chairman, Jim Barbie, um, for the record county manager, I would ask they go ahead and do their presentation and then I'll have a couple of comments regarding budget. Thank okay. you. It'll be the bottom one. It kind of surprises you there. Yep, oh, there you go. There it goes. Good morning. I'm S.C. Burris, and I'm with the Fallon Armed Forces Day, and we're here to ask the county to support our event for the veterans and first responders, and we're requesting $3,500 to pay for expenses. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Can you tell us more about the event, please? This is our fourth year putting on this event, and it just keeps growing. And we offer a free meal to a thousand militaries or first responders for each year. And, and the money we raise goes back into helping the community for veterans in need. Awesome, thank you. Jim, did you want to add your? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, just uh, for uh, recognition bandwidth of the uh, budget um, adjustments that have been requested, uh, in each category, we're looking to try to, by the end of this fiscal year, um, create a 10% uh, savings in that budget. Uh, that would not be attainable in the specific budget because that would be roughly uh, $19,200. Um, in our miscellaneous, currently, we have $6,925. Um, I was looking, and it doesn't, it doesn't appear that... Um, um, Julie included what the funding level for this organization through miscellaneous was last year. Do you guys remember? 25. 2,500 was what they received last year. They're asking 3,500 this year um, just in terms of trying to, to maintain the budget. It might be, uh, I would ask that you at least consider maybe keeping them at a flat budget of 2,500 versus the 3,500 because of the budget cuts that we're making across the county. Is there any questions or comments from board or staff? But Jim, this is in this current budget, right? This is not for the next, next one. Yeah, this is the 24 budget, which is the one we're trying to save the 10% in okay. per the, the budget meeting. I think it's kind of late to ask for that since we've already been approving stuff. No, I'm just putting that in. Yeah, I, I said it's unachievable. We have 6,900 total dollars in uh, miscellaneous. We would have to have almost the full, I think miscellaneous usually runs 20,000. So at this point, you're not going to save 10%. But just uh, with that in mind and recognition, they're currently asking for 3,500, which is 1,000 uh, over what they received last year, which was 2,500. Obviously, it's at your... Um, at your uh, decision point on where you want to go with this request. Just putting the, the data out in front of you. Thanks. Do we have any more requests coming in for this fiscal year? Do you know? Those could come um, uh, all along the way. I'm not aware of any. Uh, no. And we would try to discourage just to, to create some savings. Any other questions from board or staff? Is this... Um, <clears throat> I mean, are you having a parade or anything like that? We're not having a parade. We have um, open ceremonies with the horses, and then um, we have um, entertainment and 
oops, we have crafters, vendors, food displays. Um, we're inviting the military to come out. We always have the support of the first responders. They all show up and bring trucks and, and stuff. Is this in any way competition with uh, Armed Forces Day in Hawthorne? No, it's a different radius. Okay. <clears throat> any other questions or comments from board or staff? Can I get a motion, please? I'll make a motion to approve the funding of a, the amount of $3,500 to support the Fallon Armed Forces Day event. Second it. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. And we'll go ahead and take a picture over here, Thank too, you. as well. Thank you. Agenda item 7G, first reading consideration of possible action, Bill 2024-A, Ordinance 8, an ordinance amending Title II of the Churchill County Code to prohibit the transmission of false fire alarms. This will be Joe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is the first reading of this ordinance. I would ask that you read the title and summary into the record, and then I'll explain sort of what's going on. And I see the fire department's here as well, and they can give you more of the details on why this is being requested. Okay, the summary of the bill. This bill revises portions of the Title II of the Churchill County Code by prohibiting the transmission of a false fire alarm. Two, establishing the power of the Board of County Commissioner to set a fine for the transmission or false fire alarm and other matters related thereto. Title, ordinance amending Title II of the Churchill County Code prohibiting the transmission of a false fire alarm and other matters relating thereto, whereas Churchill County operates one of the na oh. nation's finest volunteering. <laughs> just, just that? You the the summary's good? good? Okay. <laughs> Okay. I, I was really getting into it. You said that first thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Mr. Chair, we prepared this ordinance at the request of the fire department. Uh, they have had a number of uh, automated transmissions of fire alarms that are not actually related to fire, and it's caused a disturbance in their ability to respond to other calls at the same time, uh, as well as just impacting the morale I think of the department to respond to calls that aren't actually calls. Uh, I'll let the fire department pr present. Uh, yeah so this is something that um, uh, myself as the fire chief, fire chief Jared Dooley for the record speaking, um, we've been looking at for quite some time and trying to figure out a way that we could um, reduce these false alarms. Um, the types of alarms that we're talking about are are a little varied, you know, and so sometimes uh, to write ordinance is a little is a little tricky. Uh, I believe that Joe's done a great job here, but because the alarms can include anything from um, dead batteries in a carbon monoxide alarm to um, burnt toast at somebody's house, a steamy shower at the old folks' home or the Highlands Manor, um, all of these things, um, when they go off, they're paged as a sh you know it, what to our department looks like a structure fire we 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 mobilize the exact same way and so you can see the the problem therein is uh i start rolling the duty officer starts rolling two engines start rolling uh you know 30 40 guys are leaving their jobs really quick to find out within about two to five minutes seven minutes something like that that once i show up on scene there's somebody in there um, you know their bathrobe and they've just burnt toast and so um, we talk to them about it um, we say you know we try to explain the importance but uh, 
in my 20, I guess 22 years on the department, it's never seemed to be this big of an issue. But I think because, uh, for a number of factors, and one of the largest being, well, I think a lot of the new construction comes with these monitoring systems that monitor for alarms, and they page out immediately. And a lot of the owners of these alarm systems aren't maybe terribly um, up to date on their alarm system or how to acknowledge or clear or contact the sheriff's office to say, no, this isn't a real alarm. Because when we get there, you know, most of them are sufficiently embarrassed, like, oh, I didn't know that you were going to show up with every fire truck that Churchill County owns. Um, but we do. And so this ordinance is an attempt to uh, begin to st stem that tide a little bit. Any questions or comments from border staff? So how is this going to stop a false alarm by finding people for the alarm? So they, the way that right now, if they have no idea it's even happening, because right here in this resolution, we don't have anything to say how many times it's going to happen. Is it one time, four times, five times? There's nothing in there that says it. So how is this going to teach people not to have a false alarm? So my understanding is as this moves forward, uh, and maybe Joe speaks a little bit more to this, there will be a fine associated with the first, the second, and the third um, transmission of a false alarm. What we hope to do is with that first um, transmission of a false alarm, you know, we can instruct the owner of the alarm system to, you know, there's in some instances there's repairs that can be made to these systems, or they can just call their alarm company and, and, um, figure out what the pin code to their personal alarm is. Hopefully with this first fine that we give, it will just, um, what we're talking about doing is then allowing that owner of the alarm system to go to the building department and say, hey, I've, I fixed what the problem was. Um, and then maybe the first alarm will just kind of be forgiven if that costs any money then. Yeah, but we don't want to put fear into people not to call the fire department when they need to. So if they got a grease fire on the, the stove and the alarm goes off, but it's out before you guys get there in five minutes. You know, is that a false alarm now? No, no, I don't, no but, I don't. But you don't want people to feel that way. And this is where you sit there and find somebody on the first attempt. People are going to start fearing. It's like people are afraid to call an ambulance because they don't want to be charged, even though they never will. They still have that fear there. So we don't want to put fear into people not to call in case there is an alarm. Because this just says false alarm. I don't think it says anywhere in there that it has to be from an alarm service or so, anything. So the way this is it, designed is the, the language is if, you, if there's a transmission of a request for service, either automated or manually, um, where there's no... Right. Joe, so that could be somebody just picking up a phone and calling. It could be somebody picking up the call, and it would be that they, they have no perception that an emergency exists. So if they call because there's a grease fire or they think that there is an emergency, that wouldn't be covered. That would not be something we could find for. It would be only if they realized there is no emergency and they chose not to call anyway. So for example, um, I burned my Thanksgiving dinner and the alarm went off. I know there's no emergency but I chose not to call anyway, and then someone shows up and get and fire department shows up, and they say, "Okay, look, in that case, we would we would issue, could issue. It does. It's not mandatory, but could issue a, a first fine. In that case, it's going to work through our code enforcement office. And typically, what we would do in that situation, just like all of our other code enforcement, is we'd work with the homeowner to say, "Look, we don't really want your two hundred fifty dollars. What we want you to do is either." write down the number so that you can call if you have a situation. Um, or if you have something that's causing it, for example, you had the chirping alarm, uh, carbon monoxide alarm, going for two or three days, but you didn't change your battery. And then when it went off, fire department showed up. You know, that's the type of thing where we want people to be able to say, look, there's a there is some level of enforcement that's going to encourage people to actually work with us. I, I believe in my discussion with the fire department, sometimes they come to these homes and people are embarrassed, but they, they don't actually take responsibility to solve 
that problem. So I, I know he had a couple of <laughs> continuous offenders, and I think those are the people we're mostly looking at, especially the automated folks. But we're and, finding the homeowner and not the vendor, right? That's who this fine goes to. So the homeowner is ultimately Deal. responsible for the contract with the, the vendor. Right. And just to point out again, I think that's a very important piece that we haven't really focused on. We have folks that this has happened with them four and five times. And there's no repercussion, and they don't seem to move on it. So this is not the, the one-time mistake thing kind of deal. This is about where we have a record of homeowners. But we don't homeowners. say that in this. Right, because I don't think you can say you're targeting a specific but it's not population. Repeated. You but could say repeated, right? In there? Because we're going to threaten the first time someone comes out with a... False fire I don't think alarm. it's. I don't think necessarily. It's a well, no, it's, it's a slippery slope. It starts with that. So, because now it depends on the code enforcer or Jared doing so, it. So, to be very I, careful with this. I mean, we can. the The difficulty with doing something repeated, which is is achievable, is that first time we'll have to establish some way to actually, I guess, not fine, but substantiate that we had a false fire alarm, so that the second time we could issue the fee. And so we'll go through the whole same process with somebody, you know, saying, you know, send them a letter saying you sent us a false fire alarm or determined that that's a false fire alarm. You know, if you want to object, come and tell us. But we wouldn't actually be able to issue a fee until the second time in that situation. And this, the way it's written now, it's, I guess, giving discretion to the code enforcement office as well as the fire department to work with folks and only I mean, obviously we don't know to send a fine unless the fire department sends us a note saying that we want to issue a fine to this person. So if you would like to, I can, I can attempt to address a repeat. I'd re I would like to have the repeat in there, and the and other, not just a first offender. The other component I would add into, I'd remind you that the, the code enforcement officer reports to the public works director, public works director reports to the assistant county manager, assistant county manager reports to me and I report to you. And so if we have an issue uh, with a code enforcement staff that we think is being heavy handed and that goes, you know, beyond this, rec this specific example, but anywhere along those ways, ultimately the commission has the authority to uh, manage the county manager and alleviate, you know, those kind of things. So there's always uh, hands on the controls at the at the hands of the commission. In terms of philosophy. But Joe, I would like to see repeated in there personally. Okay. Um, one other option we haven't haven't prepared the resolution for it yet because this is the first reading. But there will be the resolution would set what the fines are would right. be are they progressive or and the, the planned that? progression was to do a first um fine of say two hundred dollars two hundred fifty dollars i think and then scale it up to five hundred to a thousand the other option to doing a repeat method is to just decrease the first offense to significantly less um and that may address your same concern without creating, I think, enforcement difficulties. Food for thought here, because I'm thinking now about this. Um, is this going to encourage people to disable their fire alarms? You know, if, if you're a third time offender and you, whatever, you, you take too long of showers and you burn your food all the time and you don't want to get that fine, is this going to encourage them? You know, because they don't want a $500 fine, $250 fine. Is that going to encourage right, them this to This is what I'm talking about, a slippery slope. slope. This is what people start doing. Because I would. Um, so these, these types of ordinances exist elsewhere for the same purpose. And I do, uh, Commissioner Heath, I understand your argument of a slippery slope. But to add to what um, uh, Manager Barbie said, you know, there's all these people that kind of move up that, that chain of enforcement that are all answerable higher and higher and that's the same at the fire department where you know we have a duty officer then we have an assistant chief then we have jared you know who are all going to be looking at these things as well and i don't think the intent of this is 
to obviously have people disable their systems. It's to make it's to bring their systems um, and make them effective, right? They're not being terribly effective if if these people who own these systems don't know how to input their pin codes or to contact their alarm companies or to you know contact the fire department after these false alarms have been rung. So there's there's kind of a maybe a little bit of damage each way. Now, as far as the fire department is concerned, whether the language stipulates that um, there has to be an initial call for service that was a false alarm and then a repeat call for service would then um, kind of institute this $250 fine. I don't know that we have a dog in that fight. I think when I look at this ordinance in totality, I see it as a first step towards making people responsible for the systems that they own. Um, and it's gonna take a while, even, even an ordinance like this, you know, these people that we see constantly raising these false alarms, which, and, and I say constantly, not flippantly, I say it because we go to the same houses a number of times, and there is nothing that we can do except go to their house every time that they have some situation happen. How, how many false alarms on average do you get? In I, th I think the last time, the last quarter that we looked at, we had something like 50 false alarms. Our, our department responds to 400 calls in a year, something like that, ish, 385 so, to 411. So there's also potential when you're responding to a false alarm to have an actual alarm. Yeah, oh, I mean, it's, it's not a possibility that happens. We respond to multiple calls a lot, and uh, I guess I could research it, but yeah, I know but that's that the job of the firefighters, right? Huh? Your job is to respond when you're called. Certainly, right. and we do every time. We still have people who burn their ditches when the wind's 20 miles an hour, mm -hmm. knowing that there's a big chance of it burning up something, Guilty. and people still do it. But we don't have an ordinance to ban burn barrels and things, but we can get into that. But, you know, that, that's the slippery slope that you run into. So you could be very careful. Anytime you make a rule, there's always consequences to that rule. So, yeah. So, uh, and every time you don't make a rule, there are consequences, consequences to not to making too, that rule you as make well. one, right. But, you know, now we get into burn barrels. Where we've had that discussion in the past before. You know, then, oh, my embers are on the house. Or, you know, I'm burning my ditch and the wind's 30 miles an hour. I know I'm going to burn my shed down, but it doesn't matter. We still see it all the time. Right? Yeah. And I know it's not the same question, <laughs> but this is the slippery slope you run into. You, know, you start making rules, but I understand where you're going on that. It's just when you just say, you know, we're going to fine you for a first offense and then it's up to the discretion. People will disarm their fire alarms. They do things and then you may actually have a typical emergency where you don't have something where someone responds. Right. Well, you had a because question. five minutes is not a very long time or it could be a long time, but you know, you're sitting there figuring out what's going on, how, what's going on, what's, why is my alarm going off, and you don't know, and now you're past that five minute period. And now, you know, at that point, you guys are already rolling. So we're gonna find someone because they had no idea what's going on, and that's why you need the repetitive things, I think, in there, because things just happen, and we don't wanna threaten someone with a fine just because an accident happened. You know, but that's the way this is written. Uh yeah, I, I agree with that sentiment. We don't want people to not use their alarm systems. And uh, the fire department would obviously be amenable to something uh, uh, if, you know, however Joe wants to, uh, the attorney wants to word it as far as a repeat offense. I believe it accomplishes the same thing right. for the fire right, department. Right, because you said that you have that person does it four or five times, right? Correct. There's no consequence. And so that's there, what I want to see. The people that we're, <laughs> yeah, the, the people that we see that this happens to, um, I know that we will see again. So um, I don't know that that would be the, the end of the world as far as this ordinance is concerned. If, if it has to happen once and then we send a letter and then it, has to, then it happens again, um, I believe that when uh, Joe and I talked about this initially, we wanted there to be some latitude in there where the duty officer could, you know, th when that fine is issued, it just encouraged the person to go fix their system and then there would be no cost there would be no fine associated that would go directly in the county coffers. But, but it's very easy just to walk outside and hit that breaker for the fire system, and now it's done, right? Yes, sometimes you can't protect people against themselves. Right, so. Question. Yes. Um, is there going to be any confusion between 
fire alarms and burglar alarms? I don't, I don't know that I can speak to that question clearly. We don't get called out for burglar alarms, but I know that some of those systems are, are jointly multi. monitored, I yeah. guess. The same people who monitor fire alarms monitor door and window breaks and different things like that. And Mr. Chair and Commissioner Sharman, uh, I spoke with the Sheriff's Office regarding whether or not this was a significant issue as it relates to burglar alarms as well. They were going to let me know if they had an interest in joining it, but they expressed that they did not believe that they had enough volume of calls that were not actual burglar alarms to be a concern. They did mention they have a couple of serial repeat offenders as well, but um, this ordinance is only related to firefighting. What was your call yesterday morning at, at about 6 a.m.? Was it a false alarm? It had been going off for over a half hour. He didn't know how to fix it, so he called us. A couple nights before that, it was a leaky roof that leaked through a smoke detector, and then six hours after the carbon monoxide detector, we went to a burnt toast call. I'm, I'm really not being flip about this, Commissioner. It's, I'm, I'm just, I just want to recognize that we, re we really want to kind of pursue this a little bit so that um, people who have legitimate emergencies, real fires, whether they burn the ditch off themselves or not, we, we're going to show. I just, I want those, those people not, you, I don't right. want our response to be slowed by No, some people like just that. don't know what an actual emergency is. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where you got to watch because, you know, that, for someone that grease fire on their stove, you know, we know, okay, we'll throw a pan on or put flour on it, but there's a lot of people who don't know. You know and so we want you to come out and stop that before their house actually burns down. So, you know, for somebody, an emergency could be something different for me than it could be for you because we're trained, we know what to do. A lot of people aren't. And so anytime we sit there and put rules in, then there could be a consequence. And I just want to be very careful with that. So I think we're all kind of all on the same page here that we want to pursue this at some extent, and that's what we're voting on. I mean, if you read the adoption, there's nothing about what it's going to look like, but that'll come at a later date. So if we want to keep pursuing this, I think it's pretty easy to move on from here. So can I get a motion, please? I move to set a public hearing for April 17, 2024, on Bill 2024-A, Ordinance 8. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank Commissioners. You. Moving on to 7H, consideration of possible action approval to accept Shaw Engineering's final preliminary engineering report and an environmental review for the water treatment plant located at the golf course facility. Who's going? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chris Spross, Churchill County, um, County Manager's Office. Uh, before we begin, um, I just want to introduce Randy Hines. Uh, Randy Hines comes to us uh, from Loomis Engineering, where he spent um, almost 20 years working for them, and he has been hired as the county's new public works director. So moving forward, Randy will be the one doing these kind of presentations for you. Um, so the item that we have, the first item that we have on the agenda today uh, is kind of a culmination of um, the, the several actions that you guys have approved that the commission has approved for the preliminary engineering report uh, for the secondary water treatment plant um, shaw engineering completed the environmental review which was an integral part of completing the preliminary engineering report that has been done you have a copy of the environmental review as well as the final preliminary engineering report which is required for us to proceed with this plant and so we're here in front of you today to uh, request approval of that report. And with that, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions or comments for Chris or Randy? One, one question, Chris. This is uh, going to be reimbursable through the um, EPA grant, correct? Yeah, so uh, I've mentioned this at, at several of the meetings. Um, we did receive a, a, a 2022 earmark for this uh, in the amount of $300,000. Um, that was going to take us a long time to get. So about 18 months ago, the board approved um, this money uh, being spent out of the water wastewater fund. Uh, we have in turn found out that we can get reimbursed for these expenditures. Uh, and so we're in the process right now of getting the reimbursement for this amount of $295,000. So 
Um, although it was approved to be spent um, from the county, we will be reimbursed. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, can I get any public comment? I think everyone here is from Churchill County. Okay, can I get a motion, please? I'll make a motion to approve Shaw Engineering's final preliminary engineering report and environmental review for the new water treatment plant located at the golf course facility. Second it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. 7i consideration of possible action approval to execute an agreement between Churchill County and Shaw Engineering in the amount of $889,000 for engineering design, bidding, and construction administration for phase one of the central zone water treatment plant. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Chris Ross, Churchill County County Manager's Office. Um, so as a part of the uh, preliminary engineering report and moving forward with the plant, uh, we have received a proposal from Shaw Engineering, who as well drafted the, uh, the preliminary engineering report, uh, to begin the design of the first phase. Um, first phase of the plant includes the design of the wells, the transmission mains, the equipping the wells. Uh, it also includes um, some costs that are associated with the plant as a whole, such as survey and uh, um, geotechnical investigations and reports. Uh, and so the cost of that proposal is $889,000. That is not, uh, that does not include the design of the plant yet. That is phase two. Uh, but I do want to bring to, to the board's attention uh, that uh, this money will be expended as part of the $6 million ARPA grant that was received uh, for the construction of this plant. So uh, this is the first, uh, the first chipping away of that $6 million that the county has received. And uh, we do have Nick O'Connor from Shaw Engineering here. If there's any questions regarding the proposal, uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions from board or staff? Any public comment? Seeing none, can I get a motion? I move to approve Shaw Engineering's final preliminary engineering report and environmental review for the new water treatment plant located at the golf course facility. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Chris, for your time. And Randy. Thank you very much. Appointment 7J, consideration of possible action, approval of a revised agreement with Nevada Housing Division pertaining to the Home Means Nevada Initiative and, Church and Churchill County in the amount of $1,743,500 to support the property rehabilitation and implementation of a new pass house and daycare Center and deed restriction upon property at the close of escrow for a 30-day affordability period. Shannon. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, for the record, Shannon at Churchill County Social Services. Previously, we had brought forth um, an agreement, and it was for a different property within Churchill County that we owned. This agreement has been revised for the purchase at the Quail um, Way. I want to say court. I apologize. Way. Um, and that should be closing tomorrow. Um, and that agreement was approved for you at the last meeting. So today I'm just bringing forward so that we can get this moving forward. Um, just an update with this, we're also looking at, we have to come up with a relocation plan for the current tenants. Um, and so at the next meeting, you will have an agreement before you for property management, and that'll probably be a ratification because we'd like to get that in place. So we have a property management company that is helping with that relocation um, making sure that the properties are maintained during the time period that we're going through this. So if there's any questions, I can answer. Is there any questions for Shannon? Any public comment? Seeing none, can I get a motion, please? I'll make a motion to approve the revised agreement and deed restrictions as presented and to authorize the chair to execute the same. Second it. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. We're going to run back real quick. Sorry, Shannon. I read the wrong motion. Here. Wrong motion on H, so we're going to read that motion real quick. So, Joe, I'm going to open H back up. I read the, or not H, I, I'm sorry, I. I read I. H and not I. Click the wrong button. Yeah. 
So I move to approve an agreement between Churchill County and Shaw Engineering in the amount of $889,000 for engineering, design, bidding, and construction administration for phase one of the central zone water treatment plant and to authorize the chair to execute the same. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Now we'll jump back. Sorry, Shannon. We'll jump back to K, consideration of possible action, review, and approval of an agreement with Crescendo to complete the strategic plan for Churchill County Social Services, not to exceed $13,000. Shannon. Again, for the record, Shannon, it's Churchill County Social Services. Back in November, you approved the Churchill County Community Assessment, and the next piece was going to the strategic planning. Um, we have been notified that by Nevada Community Action Association that they will pay the $13,000 for this project, so that's what we've been waiting for. So today, I'm asking that we proceed with this contract so we can start our strategic plan. If there's any questions. Any questions or comments from board or staff? Any public comment? Seeing none, can I get a motion? I move to approve the agreement as presented and to authorize the Director of Social Services to execute the same. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Item L, consideration of possible ac action, ratification of an agreement between Churchill County Social Services and the State of Nevada Health and Human Service Director's Office in the amount of $150,000 from April 1st, 2024 to June 30th, 2025 to support the technical assistance project project to maximize Medicaid reimbursements to, Church to Churchill County. Shannon. Again, for the record, Shannon, it's Churchill County Social Services. And I apologize, a lot of these things we've been working on since November, and they've all hit this month. Um, so previously, we presented that we had met with Director Whitley um, back in November, and he actually approached us about being a pilot community <coughs> to map what all services within the community are Medicaid billable, reim Medicaid reimbursable. Um, and so we have received the funding from the director's office through the um, Fund for Healthy Nevada in the amount of $150,000. This will allow us to contract with CH, CHS um, out of Vegas, which has the expertise to do this and have done this previously for housing programs. Um, so today I'm asked to ratify this agreement and allow for myself and Jeff Weed from the Civil District Attorney's Office to negotiate the contract. Um, this will be a one-year process to go through it and it's working with every department that possibly could bill medicaid in churchill county so that we can go through and say within social services we have 15 billable codes um, within jpo we have these many to bring back a proposal to you to see how we can implement a county-wide medicaid system if there's any questions i can answer any questions from board or staff any public comment? Seeing none, can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to approve and ratify the agreement as presented and authorize Social Services Director to execute the negotiation agreement with CSH. Second it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Agenda item appointment 7M. Consideration of possible action, ratification of a funding agreement between Churchill County Social Services and the State of Nevada, Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Public and Behavioral Health, representing an increase from $202,566 for a period of November 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024, to $715,634 for a period from November 1st, 2023 to July 31st, 2026. Shannon. Again, Chandler, Churchill County Social Services. So as part of this lab agreement with the state to build the county lab, um, we identified where we had gaps in funding to support for the three-year time period that was proposed that they would help us. Um, so this is a ratification for that amendment. So it's just taking it and moving it for additional two years at this point and adding the additional $513,068. Um, this supports personnel. Um, even including a portion of my salary within all of these state grants, um, we're receiving one to 5% of my time. I think after the last seven we submitted this week, um, it's a total of about 40% of my time will be covered to assist with the lab oversight implementation. If there's any questions. Any questions, any questions or comments for Shannon? Any public comment? Seeing none, can I get a motion, please? I move to approve and ratify the agreement as presented. 
Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Did anyone want, oh, thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Did anyone want to pull any of the letters received? Yes. Which one would you like to pull? I just, G. G. I, I'd like to get just a, a little bit more of an explanation. For those in the that. audience who are not following the agenda, G is Nevada Division of Environmental Protection's request for re release slash spill information from Lumen Technology for a release of a level three contaminant at I-80 exit 65 at the Nightingale Road in Churchill County, Nevada. Joe? Yeah, can somebody give me a little something on received. Jeez. This, this uh, county manager, Barbie, um, I can speak for myself. I'm not prepared to respond to it, but I can get more information and report back to the commission. I don't know if Joe has any more. I don't have any more than that. I'd be happy to, to do a little more research into what exactly happened here. That's fine. From the looks of it, it was a release of approximately 150 to 170 gallons of diesel fuel to the surrounding soil and pavement. Might have been a tractor trailer, possibly. Could have just been an accident. We can look into it, though, and bring it back on the next meeting. Okay. Moving to new business, 9A, consideration of possible action, approval of a special assessment on each taxable parcel in the Carson Desert groundwater basin, totaling $18,000, and to certify the amount of the special assessment to be entered on the 2024-2025 secure tax roll by the county treasurer, Linda. Good morning, members of the board. Linda Rothery, Churchill County Clerk Treasurer for the record. This is the last of the groundwater basin from the Nevada Division of Water Resources. This is the Carson, water, um, uh, Carson Desert groundwater basin. It is totaling $18,000, and that's going to be split between over 12,000 parcels, active parcels. Um, the last year's, this actually went down, Buzz, I figured I'd better tell you this. It was 24,000 last year, and it went down by $6,000, so that is a good thing. I'm looking for board approval, and I can answer any additional questions. Any questions or comments for Linda on this agenda item? Seeing none, can I get a motion? I make a motion to levy a special assessment on each taxable water user in the Carson Desert groundwater basin, totaling $18,000, and to certify the amounts for the special assessments to be entered in on 2024 2025 secured tax roll by the county treasurer. Second it. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank aye. you, Linda. Thank you. Consent items. Did anyone want to pull any of those, or can I get a motion to approve that? I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Moving on to, does anyone have any agenda items they want to consider for the future? Okay. Uh, Commissioner and, and management staff reports. You want to start, Justin? I have nothing to pass at this time. I have nothing as well. Buzz? No, I don't have anything, but I do want to go back to uh, future agenda items. Do we want to, the, 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 the thing that Lonnie Fott talked about, uh, Love Fallon Day, do we want to, provide any kind of dollar for that? I think that's in the purview if they want to apply for it. I, I don't, don't think that's what they wanted. There. I think they just wanted support. I think they want us to talk about it. Because it's more of a volunteering. People. Okay. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, this is Jim Barbie. I, I can um, have Ann direct Ann to uh, basically con connect with them on their social media, and the county can then repost their social media uh, parts and pieces. Uh, the, the process for them to request funds would be to request funds through the uh, community support grant, which uh, we just went through and approved the 3500 which draws that down to about 3200 um, and remaining for fiscal year FY24. Sorry, I get lost in those. All right. Thank you, Jim. Is that all you had, Buzz? Yeah, that's all I have. Okay. Sherry? No, thank you. Joe? Nothing, thank you. You got anything, Jim? Uh, nothing, just working on budget. Linda? 
Um, on March 22nd, I spoke to the legislatures. We're starting our election talks, and this was a, a discussion during the ledge operations and election meeting um, on tribal polling places, so I did that. And after that, I spoke to News 2, and uh, in regards to our voter registration top-down system, I know this was a first for me, and um, I, I was one of three, because they talked to Washoe County um, interim registrar voter and then Carson C clerk recorder and base uh, we had been uh, sending letters to the Secretary of State letting them know that the timeline for our top-down system was too fast because we needed to validate everything dual entry you name it um, that way when we move into a new system we can go right into it you know as the validation process goes so that was that um, so that was good um, next Monday this coming Monday I'll be I, as well as all the elected clerks, are meeting with the governor and the secretary of state. This is going to be a uh, meeting luncheon. Um, don't know what it's about quite yet. So that'll be kind of nice to do. Um, for our office, we mailed out just under 1,000 um, delinquent property tax bills. And then our tax sale is moving along. It will be, it'll be on the 18th and 19th of this month. We are... We've actually got everybody to pay. We're down to three parcels now in its land. And that's all I have to give you guys right now. Thank you, Pam. Nothing for, nothing for me. Okay, is there any public comment? Mr. Chairman, um, yes. Jim Barbie, County Manager for the record, responding to item G, uh, the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection uh, spill request and reviewing that letter real quick so that we can go ahead and put that to bed. Basically, uh, a company, well, the company being uh, Lumen Technologies, had a generator in place where they had a cracked valve. That cracked valve resulted in 150 to 170 gallons of diesel fuel that was released from that uh, generator that was in place, which exceeds the standard placed through the Nevada Administrative Code by uh, the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, requiring action, which basically this letter is informing uh, the Loomis outfit that they have to provide a summary report of the uh, incident and um, an explanation of their efforts to mitigate the, the spill itself and a plan for action moving forward and monitoring any future incidents that would occur through that. So uh, when they do that, when we have those kind of spills, I know we've seen them out at the Navy base as well, the um, Department of Environmental Protection provides those letters and then the Churchill County is CC'd as the governing body um, in the county, but it's actually an in-depth uh, action with that individual company and is run through, through that entity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Jim. You. Thanks, Jim. Any public comment? Seeing none, we're adjourned.